All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our second live event of the day. We've kicked off Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. My name is Carolyn Dubé, and I'm the executive director here. I am a fertility patient and a fertility advocate, and I've been with the organization for five years now. And I have the pleasure of speaking with you today with um, not only a fertility patient, but um, the chair of our patient advisory council. So as you may not know, Canadian um, Fertility Matters Canada is a Canadian charity and we provide support, information and advocacy to uh, patients across Canada, the one in six Canadian couples, plus anybody in the LGBTQ community or someone who's, tra who's starting, the fam um, starting a family all by themselves as a single parent. We provide support, information and advocacy work on, um, on behalf of the Canadian patient. And what's interesting is that we're a national organization, but we only have two staff. So anything that you see coming out of our office is actually happening to staff people and a whole army of volunteers who are working behind the scenes to help bring events like Canadian Infertility Awareness Week to you. So I want to thank Kelly for being here. She has an incredible story. Um, and I can't wait for her to share her story with you to give you some hope, some, um, you know, so you feel like you're not in this alone. Uh, Canadian Infertility Awareness Week, our theme this year is we see you. So I'm hoping that the conversation that Kelly and I have today is going to give you a really good, um, you know, view of the organization and 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 make you feel connected to an organization that's um, really driven by patients for the patient. So, Kelly, welcome. Thank you all the way Thank from Saskatchewan. <laughs> yes. So, Kelly, why don't we start and I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your journey as a fertility patient. Sure. Yeah. It, let me start or preface by the most interesting for, thing for me on my journey is that when it first started, I was very closed mouthed about it. I was not comfortable speaking about it. I didn't want people to know I was going through it. Now, five years, almost five years into my journey, if anyone will listen, I am willing to talk. And it's quite interesting how that has evolved for me over the years. Um, it's definitely becoming more and more comfortable speaking about my journey. And a big part of that is because I want to help other people through it. Um, so my husband and I got married in September of 2015. Um, we decided to start trying right away. Um, we were kind of at a point where it was like, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, whatever, we're not in a big, big rush. Well, here we are almost five years later, and a lot has happened in that five years. Um, we've gone through a few IUIs that did not work. Um, we've gone through two rounds of IVF now that did not work. Both of them, um, came, we came out with nothing from them. We had one transfer from each IVF, um, but both did not result in um, a full-term pregnancy. Um, and it's just, it's been an interesting journey. And the one thing I've really tried to pay attention to is seeing the silver lining. And I know that that is such a hard thing to do when we want something so badly and we're not getting it. It confuses us why we're not getting that. So for me, the silver lining is a few things. Um, I think my infertility journey, and I, I don't think I know that this journey has actually strengthened my marriage, which for me, that is amazing. It's brought us together. Um, it's allowed us to communicate more, be emotional with each other, et cetera. Um, silver lining as well, me becoming involved with this organization. I don't think I would have found it had I not gone through almost five years of struggles. I would have never come to this place where I'm like, hey, is there something out there to support me? Um, so essentially the journey is still going, um, almost five years in the making, but there's been a lot of incredible things that have happened throughout that five years. So that's the really, really quick of it. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, you know, and you're on this side um, of your journey, you're still in the trenches really as a fertility mm -hmm. patient. You're really, mm -hmm. really, um, your journey hasn't ended as so many mm -hmm. people who are watching uh, right now, they're, you know, I'm sure we have people watching who are who have just found out that they have an issue with their fertility, or maybe they're questioning, I think I might have an issue with my fertility. Like, what do I do? This is incredibly scary. I mean, when I remember when we first got the diagnosis of being infertile in a voice message left on our phone, um, we were a young oh man. Oh my. Mm -hmm. uh, it was incredibly shocking. I mean, maybe we had prepared a little bit for, for that diagnosis, but 
when those words are left in a voicemail from a urologist, that was it. Come see me in my office. That was like, I'll never forget how alone I felt and the emotions that my husband and I had gone through and the, the strain on our relationship as you go through these different levels and different phases of the journey together, but yet really sometimes separately, we have male factors. So I can appreciate you still being in the trenches right now, like so many other people. Um, so thank you for sharing that part of your story. So I'd love to know, you know, what part of sort of looking back and looking forward, you know, is there anything that surprised you about this journey? Is there anything, you know, when you looking at now, though you're still in the middle of it, is there anything you'd love to tell yourself back when you just found out that this was going to be an issue? Yeah, I think what, what for me is very, very interesting is before I started this journey, I had a friend who was struggling to get pregnant. And I remember vaguely listening to her. She, she wasn't a, she's not a person who really opened up to people. I knew she was struggling and that's about all I knew. And I, I don't think I could wrap my head around what that meant when I hadn't gone through it yet. And now that I'm going through it, I'm like, holy crap, was she dealing with a lot of stuff. So it's really, really, really hard for people who aren't in it to understand everything that comes with it. It's emotional. It's physical. It's financially draining. It's spiritually draining. It's every single way is it draining for us. And I just, I, I, I think what it comes down to is we need to be compassionate with each other. We need to understand that we all have our own journey. And I think the biggest thing for me that, I wish I would have known in the beginning is that I needed to reach out for support sooner, I think would be the thing for me. Because for me, and this, this sounds so crazy, and I, I think some people can relate to this who've been on this journey, but actually the longer my journey goes on, I don't want to say the easier it becomes, but the more that I've accepted that this is my journey. My first two years were the hardest. They were like, I didn't understand, sorry, I'm going to get emotional. I didn't understand why this was happening to me why why I was chosen to go through this and I think that was the hardest pill to swallow lucky for me I have well I guess I don't want to say it's lucky for me but I have friends and I have actually cousins going through the same thing who've been very very supportive they started going through this before me so yeah my first two years were the hardest and I wish I would have reached out for support sooner I don't think I need it and I still don't think I need like counseling support. It's more just knowing that there's other people out there going through this and it's okay to feel everything you feel. It's okay to, for example, avoid baby showers. It's okay to not go to your friend's kids' birthday parties. It's okay to not go to school concerts if, if that's hard for you. And I think over time, that's something I've really come to realize is it's okay. It's okay for me to feel these ways and it's okay for all of us to deal with our emotions how we need to and typically like I haven't cried in a long time about this journey I just think it's being vulnerable in front of everybody that's that's Absolutely. challenging but yeah thank it's, you, it's thank just, you for for letting us be part of this story and see how vulnerable absolutely. Or, or becoming vulnerable because I can tell you that by you sharing your story right now you are giving other people you are changing their lives um so thank you for that it's incredibly important. absolutely Absolutely. And, and you know what's super ironic is, again, in the first two years, I cried a lot. Like, don't get me wrong. I cried a lot. Every single month I was crying. And I couldn't tell you the last time I've cried only because it, it reminds me so much of the, the steps of like going through grieving. Is it's like the acceptance, the denial, the blob, like all those different stages. I'm at a point where it's like, okay, Kelly, just trust. It's going to work out. Everything will be okay. And it's just, yeah, the longer it's gone on. Uh, yeah, not the easier. I don't know what word I like there, but it's just, I've just, it, it's become the reality and I'm okay with it. It's all going to work out. Yeah. So I wonder, and I'm not sure the answer to this. Do you feel that maybe <laughs> feeling because you've connected with a group and an organization like Fertility Matters, is there some part of it that feels, you know, okay, I've connected with a community of people. There are so many other people, I'm sure, especially your involvement in this organization at the level you're involved with the organization. You know, I mean, I know that you're connecting with people who have struggled building their families every single day. Um, and do you feel that maybe, I, and I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you feel that maybe 
the information that you've gathered, the like connecting with the social media or connecting with the website to say, wow, this is, do you feel more empowered? Do you feel, talk me through some of that stuff. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing was I always knew I wasn't the only person in the world on this journey. It was always very obvious that that wasn't the case. But it's just it's been so nice to be within this community of being able to share our stories and bounce ideas off each other and experiences and saying, hey, have you ever tried this? Have you tried acupuncture? Have you tried this, et cetera? So it's just it's been very important for me to be part of this community on two on two sides of things to receive support and to also give support. I think it's so important that because of the years that I've spent in the trenches, like you called it, I feel like I can't just hold that information in for myself. I need to be able to get out there and give it to others. And I'm comfortable to do that as well. I'm okay to say, hey, this is my story. It's been five years of a lot of, a lot of downs and a few ups, but a lot of downs. And I'm okay with that story right now. I want, obviously, the outcome, but I'm okay with it. And I'm willing to share that. And I'm willing to speak with others about it. So, yeah, it's just, it's been so important for me to, to provide that support and also just receive that support as well. Yeah. And I, I mean, you provide so much support. Kelly, for those of you who don't know, um, Chairs Our Advisory Council has been instrumental in bringing forward CIAW this year. The events, she's been heavily involved in the events and the um, activities, virtual activities that we've got going on. Um, so she's played an integral part of bringing that information. The patient voice, bringing information to the patients, it's incredibly powerful. Kelly, I'd love to know, tell me why CIAW, so for those of you who don't know, CIAW is Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. We are aligned with NIAW, which is in the United States with our, our partners in Crime Resolve, the support organization there. Um, we've combined our weeks and we work together to support Canadians and American families going through this. Um, I'd love to know why CIAW is important to you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> How much time do we have here? I would say, I would say for me, there's, there's three things that are very, very important for me when it comes to this. The first piece of it would be just education. Um, we have so many amazing speakers lined up this week that are going to educate us on all different topics that come within this fertility world. Um, and for me, that is so important. It's important for the people that are dealing with infertility to be parts of these events and learning from these people. But it's also important for the people who maybe have someone going through infertility that they know that they can learn from these events like oh that's what's happening or that's why they feel that way or that's that's how i can support them etc so the education piece is huge um the other thing um i guess it's kind of a stem off of the education piece is just up-to-date information what is happening right now in 2020 as far as this and i don't want to call it an industry but that's the word i'm going to use right now um especially in the light of covid what's happening right now how is this affecting people how are clinics dealing with it etc so that's a very very important thing for us to know about as well and for me the biggest biggest piece is and it's what we've talked about for most of this is the support that we are able to provide to people um I think I think a lot of it what it comes down to too is people might not want to be heavily involved in these events but I think even just watching something for 10 minutes they might think okay I feel better I know I'm not alone I can go to this organization and I can get support when I am ready for it because there's a lot of people going through this that they don't feel ready to jump in and get that support yet they're not comfortable with saying I'm infertile I think that's the biggest thing it's crazy so when people are ready to step forward and get that information there is so much available not only in CIAW week but also throughout this organization what we provide to people so it's just incredible um, the support that people can receive and we also what's really cool um, is this week we have two wine and cheese events which are just going to be people getting together to chit chat and Love then it. a coffee coffee and conversation as well. So three different events where it's just people getting together and chatting. And that's what has to happen is it's just it's great to be able to sometimes just tell your story, have a good cry. And then after that, you're like, wow, I feel I feel better. I'm just glad that I could get that off my chest for today. So just so much going on this week. So many amazing things. I have them all in my calendar. It's going to be a busy week for me watching them. But I'm so, so dang excited. Thanks. You know, it's true. It's these wine and cheese and coffee and conversations. Fertility Matters provides online support groups. So for those of you who are watching, we have support groups and they're aligned, you know, sort of territorial or provincially. Um, and we also have 
uh, in-person support groups. So those are peer-led from other fertility patients. You can find those on fertilitymatters.ca um, you know, if, you, if you're looking for an in-person support group, group. But in the wake of COVID, what's interesting is um, we can't do those support groups anymore. And something that Fertility Matters Canada does really well is support patients online. We are a national organization. I sit here in Moncton, New Brunswick, um, and our advisory council is coast to coast to coast. And so we connect, and what an amazing, you know, it's a really uncertain time for Canadian fertility patients. You know, we don't know yet when the doors of fertility clinics will open, but we do know that they will. Um, and in the meantime, we're trying to provide the support and the information and the education to patients to say, okay, this is where we are. And we know it stinks. Um, and it's, you know, if we had an end date and we knew that the clinics would open on this date, we could kind of live with that. And right now we're in this really muddy, murky water. But there's lots of things that patients can do right now. Lots of clinics are doing telemedicine calls, physicians and patients. Um, we've got so many experts lined up to say, okay, this is what you can do right now in this time. No matter what stage of the journey you're in, um, we're going to be providing information and, and resources on those exact things so that you feel like you're, you've got some control and you've got the ability to move your journey forward um, as much as you aren't walking through the doors of a fertility clinic. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, and that's incredibly, I, I agree that that's why CIAW is incredibly important. Um, I'd love for you to know, you know, some words for those patients um, or potential patients who are watching, you know, why should they, why should other Canadians who are struggling to build their families no matter why they're struggling to build their families, you know, they have to use a assisted reproductive technology for whatever reason. Why should they care about CIAW? Tell me why it should be important to them. Well, I think the, the biggest thing would be we need to bring awareness to this world or situation of infertility. And again, until I started going through it, I had no idea how challenging it was in every single aspect. I had no idea. So I think events like this and people um, really be, being involved in events like this is what brings awareness to infertility, which I think is very, very important. I think it's also super important for, I know tons of people going through infertility live in silence about it. And you know what? Infertility reminds me so much of mental health struggles and mental health struggles are involved in infertility, but for some reason, people are just so inclined to just, they're, they're, they do it in their home, and that's all that happens. No one knows they're going through it. Um, they're, they're not comfortable maybe with speaking about it, which is completely fine. Um, but I think what it comes down to is what we're providing for people to, to be part of is just knowing they're not alone, knowing there's other people going through this. Um, and that's so important. Even if people don't get fully involved in these events, just knowing that they are not alone is so important. Um, and I think it's also incredible for um fertility patients to be able to see and again no matter where you are on your journey just starting to try and get pregnant or you've done however many rounds of IVF it's so important to be able to listen to speakers who are professionals in their industry or field so to get information from people on egg health to get information on apps about fertility to get information on it's just so important to be able to get really good up-to-date professional information um, and this is the place to get it CIAW is the place to get it. We have all of these speakers lined up who are giving this incredible week of information that's going to be information overload, but in the best possible way. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, th I think the last thing I would mention is just the importance of having a voice and advocating for change. Um, so, for example, where I live in Saskatchewan, there is no funding available to help with infertility and cycling. Um, so the amount of money that we've put into trying to get pregnant, there's been no help for us. Um, certain provinces do have help. Um, and I think that's really important for us to, to put a voice out there to know that this is incredibly challenging. We, we want support to build our families. And by having this type of event is, is really the best way to do that, just bringing awareness to infertility in general. Absolutely. I think that that's really important. Just, you know, and the education, sometimes I remember when we were going through our fertility journey, I, I'm a very vocal person. I'm a very social person. I'm incredibly close with my friends and family. 
And when we got this diagnosis, I didn't talk about it with anybody. And I didn't realize it until years later when I was being interviewed for something else. And I said, wow, I, I really shut down. I closed off. I shut relationships mm-hmm. off. I didn't go to showers. I didn't connect with friends who had kids. Um, and I, you know, I strained relationships, not only with my husband, but with my, you know, especially probably some friends. I didn't realize I was doing it. They probably didn't realize what was going on and why it was happening. Um, but looking back, I think, gosh, if I had only started connecting with the community earlier, if mm-hmm. I had only had, you know, information, like you said, from medical professionals that I could access without having to go to a clinic, just mm-hmm. to make me feel more in control, more educated, more empowered to make decisions about my own reproductive health goals on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, you know, I feel like it would have made a lot of difference in how I was personally feeling. Um, and so I know I became, I started advocating because um, we had to do IVF and we did have children through IVF. And after our first child was born, um, I started, I realized like, this is crazy that people don't have access to this information. And I never wanted anybody else to feel so alone as I did and my husband did. And, um, and I, I promised myself that I would advocate and that's what I, that's how I got into the, this, this world. Um, because it's not how I started. This is not my, this is, wasn't the industry I worked in or trained in. Um, so it's incredibly powerful to see what's happening. And I think with the world, with social media and, you know, especially I think even Instagram where you can almost, it's okay to talk about these things almost behind a handle. You can on Facebook, it's a little more personal. So Mm -hmm. you're okay sharing it personally, but on Instagram, you can create a handle and, and talk about your feelings and connect with this international community um that's struggling and i think it's really beautiful so can i just jump in there's one thing that's super interesting that just came up for me is that i think for me especially once we got to the point where we were doing ivf why it was so important for me to be involved in a community that could support me through it is my god if i had just shown up at the clinic to do the retrieval that day and not had any idea what a retrieval was like i would have like it's not terrifying at all Going into it, I was not scared because I knew what to expect. But if I had just shown up, I would have been terrified because it would have been like, okay, here's the room. You lay down. This is what's going to happen. I would have been scared because I didn't understand that beforehand. But being able to speak with people and then say, hey, Kelly, this is what's going to happen. You're going to take injections. You're going to show up, blah, blah, blah. I went in there going, oh, this sounds fairly easy. Like it's it's still, it's hard on our bodies, et cetera. You felt empowered probably. You felt in control. You, yes. 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 Yeah. Type A personality. I needed to know what was happening and and what was going on. (laughs) So Kelly, in closing, is there any, like, do you have any last words? Do you have any pieces of advice? Do you have anything you want to say to the people who are watching about, you know, their journey or this week or whatever? Uh, Yeah, I would say, well, two, two big, big things for me. Um, This is your journey and you process your emotions as you see fit or as you feel comfortable with. So like I said, in the beginning, my emotions were all over the place and I was fairly quiet about the journey. Now it's like my emotions, obviously I cried a little bit today, but my emotions aren't as all over the place. Um, I'm more, again, I've just, I've learned that this is our journey. This is how things will go. Um, And there's been a lot of emotions over the years that I struggled to process for a long time. And once you, you, you realize, okay, this is what's happening to me. Everything comes in its timing. Um, I'm at peace with whatever's going on because when we stress ourselves out, my God, that is so hard on our bodies. I understand we all want kids. If we're struggling to get pregnant, we're, we're really, we're really um, anxious about why not, et cetera. But it's just processing those emotions, realizing, you know, what everything's going to happen when it's supposed to happen in divine timing. Um, that would be my first thing. And then my second thing is, is, it's, so I guess this is still to the emotion side, but it's okay for you to, to do certain things. So what I mean by that is, and I said this before, it's okay, like you said, um, certain things about like relationships with friends. I know that's a really challenging one, 
But if there's, like I said, baby showers you don't want to go to, don't go if you know that it's going to be hard on you. Um, there's certain things I've avoided because I went once to something and I literally was sick to my stomach for two days after because I knew it was something that was going to be hard to do. But I pushed myself to do it thinking that would be okay. So that situation or that scenario made me realize you know what, Kelly, you're not comfortable with that. And that's okay. Don't force yourself to do things you're not comfortable with. So um, processing your emotions and then just realizing it's okay to, to do what is best for you and never feel guilty about that. If you don't want to go out with girlfriends because you got your period yesterday, don't go. You're not going to have fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. And you're not, you're not going to, you're, yeah, you're just you're not going to enjoy it. So just don't do it. And that's okay. It's okay. Um, sorry, I guess it'd be a third thing there. Um, to me, it's not a bad idea. It depends what extent I guess you're comfortable with, but just letting your friends know what you're going through. They don't need to know the whole piece and puzzle, but I think it's really important for them to know things like, you know what, I'm really sorry if, if I'm disconnected, if I'm not coming to things, I'm dealing with this and that's why. Because if you're canceling last minute, if you're avoiding things, they're going to think that you're pissed off at them. Really? Oh, sorry. Beep. Your, okay. your beep at them. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, I think it is really important just at least for them to know, hey, I'm not, I'm not comfortable sharing too much. This is kind of what we're going through. So if I feel disconnected from you, this is why. Just please understand that this is what's going on. Because I think that is really important as well. Yeah, that's great advice, actually. And I did get caught up in that myself. And I didn't, wasn't mm -hmm. as open at first. And looking back, I wish I had been more open. Um, I think that you know, as a fertility patient, there will be patients who are able to use their voice. Um, they're more mm -hmm. comfortable. There will be patients who can't use their voice. They're not comfortable with that. And that's okay. And so we are here as an organization to encourage those of you who are interested in sharing your story, no matter what part of the journey. Maybe you need to get through your journey before you talk about it. Maybe you're mm -hmm. very open about it from day one. Um, we encourage you to share your story because it will give hope to those who aren't there yet and who maybe never will be, and, and that's okay. But speaking for them, helping them, giving them a voice, especially during Canadian Fertility Awareness Week, is incredibly powerful. And I invite you mm -hmm. all to join us on all of our social media platforms. Of course, Facebook, we're very active over on Instagram. We've got some awesome contests happening over there so make sure you like us at fertility underscore Canada uh, on Instagram and on Twitter if you're more of a Twitter user great pop on over there the conversation is still happening you can join um, you can like all of the events we have them listed on Facebook and of course on fertilitymatters.ca forward slash FMC events uh, and you can follow uh, the CIAW website to find out more information about the week fertilitymatters.ca forward slash CIAW. Kelly, thank you for your time today. Thank you You're for welcome. the hours that you have been pouring into this week. <laughs> really, really in, um, informative and supportive for patients. We appreciate that. And for those of you who are watching, thank you for your time today. We hope that you'll connect with us through the week. We've got some incredible lineups um, of experts and patients and mindfulness sessions and just facts and figures and those types of things that are important for you um, to, to empower you on your journey. And we encourage you to download our image or share an image of your journey on social media using the hashtags, hashtag CIAW2020 and hashtag WeSeeYou2020. Thank you so much for joining. We are thrilled and we'll see you all back tomorrow for a whole bunch more uh, live events. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in.